Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we're going to go through kind of an overview of where we should be at this point and how to make sure that all of our students, now that hopefully we have our rosters um, for our classes are in, that we're able to get them added into AET. Um, and then finally end with um, what to do with those students on day one of class so that they can fill out their information and make our lives easier as educators. Um, so, so far you should have completed our chapter profiles, your program enrollment, um, all of the teacher profiles, hopefully you've been able to add your courses for this year and set up our teacher logins and then explore a little bit of the optional strategic planning tools. Um, if you have any questions or have trouble getting logged into your teacher accounts, please go ahead and message Dr. Sheehan or myself um, and we can get that taken care of. And then remember, after today's session, you're able to go to FFA.org under teacher resources to the AET resources and complete a quiz for CEU credit. So today we're really going to focus on what to do with students in AET. Um, as a reminder, this is for all of our IGED students, not just our FFA students. Um, and today we're going to review kind of those required components of our profiles and getting all of our students into AET as we get started. Um, if we go to AET, so mnffa.org AET resources, and then go under teacher resources, we can then find AET training resources. Um, we're going to start out with our chapter profile and teacher profile, just as a reminder to make sure that we have those set up. Um, so if we click this help sheet, it will take us to the teachers getting started. And we're going to go through all of the steps of this today just to make sure we have it. Um, so go ahead and take a moment and log into your AET account. Um, so if you go to the AET.com. I'm already logged in. If you click login and then under your teacher login, you should have your username, which is usually your school email and then a password that you have set up. And go ahead and get logged in. So just a reminder, we logged in just now using our school or our FFA chapter number. Um, that was the old way of doing it. Everyone has their own individual logins going forward. So if you've already set that up, that should work. If you haven't or are navigating from that old system, just let me or Lava know. Um, it might require us to do like a one-time password reset as we kind of help you um, get that. In the future, you would just be able to hit password reset. Uh, but as we move over from chapter logins to individual ones, um, you might need some help. So just reach out if you're running into any trouble. Yep, and I'll show you where to look to see if it's an email issue that's causing the problem. So the first thing we're gonna look at is our chapter profile. So under the first tab of profile, we should have a number under 2020, 2020, 2021. Um, and if you know your numbers for the last two years, that's a great place to add them as well, just for your records. Um, and it helps the Department of Ed reports. We're going to start with the update your program's contact information, data, or password. And so this is our opportunity to make sure that our addresses are correct and our phone numbers are correct. Um, this is the address that we use to send invoices to. Um, so we send electronic invoices, but it's nice to have the billing address on here or the physical address because um, this is the address that is pulled from, um, from mailings from our partners um, like MailC and the FFA Foundation. So please make sure that if your school's address has changed, um, this should be your, your mailing address um, right here. If you want to go on your program data all the way back, you can click the data tab and you can put in the last 10 years of enrollment if you have it. Um, but we are just asking that you make sure that you put in this year's. So start with your chapter contact information under the profile tab. The next thing is looking at your teacher profiles. Um, so all of your teachers should be listed 
If you are logged in just as your individual person, um, you should only be able to see your information. Um, this is where you can set up your individual profiles if those aren't already set up um, or let Dr. Sheehan or I know and we can help get you set up. Um, hey, Lavin? Yeah. Um, one question. Now, they've, here we, they've got the first week of school to change classes. Okay. Are we better off just to wait till after that first week before we actually put our numbers and stuff in? That's probably best. I mean, you can change it at any time, but whatever, it works for you to remember it. Good question, John. So under our teacher profiles, um, I've clicked into mine. You can go ahead and add your mailing address, um, your home mailing address, email address, any secondary email addresses, and your phone number. Also, if you are in a multiple person program and you are the FFA head advisor, you can go ahead and click that button. Um, or if you're a department head, you can click that button as well. The next tab is some uh, demographics that you can answer. Your history is your teaching history including where you student taught and where you went to college. If you have any extra certifications, you can go ahead and add, them the, add those there. So maybe you're case certified, um, or if you have a teaching license in another state, if you have a special ed credential. Service, this is kind of like your um, resume, if you want to try to keep track of how long you've been a member of different things. And then your annual data would be survey information. So the Department of Ed used to send out a survey of this information. Um, and so to save you time, we're asking that you put that here so that we um, don't have to send out more surveys. And then this last tab is where you can reset your passwords for your individual teacher accounts. Um, so your email address should be your school email address, and then you can reset your password here. Once you do that once, you should be able to log in just using your individual password. Eventually the chapter logins aren't gonna work, um, but since this is a transition, we're encouraging you to get those set up now because um, eventually the chapter numbers will get turned off. What can I clarify on the teacher or chapter profiles? Can you go back to the certifications? So it looks like some things got changed. It used to be that under your profile, there was like these check boxes where you would describe what licenses you have and we, it, it could have been confusing for people. And so I think this will be a little bit easier for us. And so the, some of these terms are terms from other states. And so we don't have a, you know, we have a general education license uh, for agriculture. So I think we could put that under there. And then we have some other, other teaching credentials might be other states. So if you like, I have a California license, I might put that down there because that's not as relevant here to Minnesota. But this designated subject would be, um, maybe work-based learning is a designated subject. It's very specific compared to general ed. Um, I don't know that there's a right or a wrong way to put it here, but these labels were a little confusing under the other tabs. This cleans it up quite a bit. So I might, if I was completing this, I might say that I have a CPR certification. I have a teaching credential in agriculture, and then I have a, a, a designated teaching credential maybe in work-based learning, or you could put it under teach the single subject too. Um, these words mean something in other states, they don't quite as much here, but mm -hmm. before there was no descriptions. Yep. I'd encourage you to add like case certifications and things like that. Sometimes it's nice for us to be able to point new teachers to who some of those people are that have those certifications um, so they know if they meet the needs of that school district. But I, like the designated subject, so if we were in trade and industry, they have like a construction 
license. To me, that would be more of a designated subject. Like it, they can only teach manufacturing. So the case you're talking about should be put under just certifications? All right, that, yep. <clears throat> so if you go to certifications, the case ones pop up. It's like I'm case animal certified in 2012, I think. So I can insert that there. Can you go into the general ed one just to see what are some of the pop-ups that might help us? Out of state prepared. Peace Corps, private school. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Things have all changed since the last time we looked. Would coaching go underneath then uh, other teaching credentials? I wonder if those go under certifications. Maybe not. I'm going to try other teaching and see what it shows us. No, I don't. Eminent certification. <laughs> That's the right question, John. I don't know where coaching would go. So I anticipate these will be added to um, the last page. That's one that I can add. Or I can ask them to add. Um, Lavin and Zane, also under the uh, service one, it says your profession. And when you go there, the only organizations that pop up are CVATA and BATAT. <laughs> um. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> yes, so we'll get that cleaned up. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we probably should have um, MINACTE, yeah. NAAE, MAAE, ACTE, probably Education Minnesota should be in there. Yeah, and VATAT doesn't even exist anymore. They changed their name. So maybe I wonder if there'd be more value in just saying like national NAAE and then state NAAE. Or letting us actually be able to type into those would be great. Right. Can you type into them? Oh, is it let us? Okay. It might on some and not on the other. I'm not sure. Yeah, it did let me type it. So it just doesn't auto populate. All and right. it only and it only gives you like one year. Yep, I think so. Like, time. oh, but then it shows up. What if you type twenty eight nineteen to present? Wait, yep, yep. Like, like a naughty symbol. Mm -hmm. Won't let you do that. Nope. Okay. All right, I have some notes for ADT. So <laughs> thank you guys for helping us figure this out. Um, any other questions on chapter or personal profiles? Um, all right, so then if we go through our um, spreadsheet, the next thing is to set up our courses. So again, under the profile tab, but this time we're under our school and set up the courses taught. John, what's one of the classes that you have this year? This past year or this coming year? Whatever works. Oh. Well, I just, period one, real living intro to egg, semester two. I put it in by semesters this time because kids, 
They're supposed to be year-long classes, but they sometimes insert kids that don't fit somewhere else. All right, so if I had an intro to egg class, that's multiple pathways. Um, it's a mul multiple pathways class type. I typed in the name that it is intro to egg. You said period one, and then I can hit save. So now these courses show up for my students to see. Any questions on adding courses? They do appear in the order you type them in, actually backwards of the order you type them in, um, and there's not a way to sort them yet. It'll go by date though. Okay. Oh yeah, it does. You start them a day earlier or later. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about today um, in preparation for day one is adding our students. Um, so if we go to our accounts tab and then manage all accounts, I'm gonna recommend that you add multiple accounts at one. Um, so this green box has a lot of things that are very helpful. Um, so I already went through and I cleared out old students. I was able to inactivate them. Um, just as a reminder, um, we'll go ahead and inactivate our example students. So you can click them and then just click mark inactive. That doesn't delete them, it just gets them out of your system so you're not sorting through thousands of students over the year. Um, when I have my final rosters, then I'm gonna go to this green box and click multiple. And whatever classroom roster system you have, go ahead and either copy it into Excel or download it into Excel, depending on the company um, you have. But I just put it into this Excel spreadsheet. And then that's so last name, first name. Copy and paste them in. And you can click add accounts. And it automatically adds all of those students to have their own account. The default for their username and password is the first letter of their first name and their full last name with the first letter of their first name being capitalized and the first letter of their last name being capitalized. Um, so for example, T Curtis, that is his username and password for default. And so what I was able to do is to give those to students um, and just say that's always your default password and then the first day we went to the computer lab I'd have them change their password. So this is going to look a little different um, each time you do it. Uh, Lavin, do you want to turn on sharing for me for here for a second? Uh, so like I exported my roster here um, from a class I'm actually teaching right now and I'll pull it up here in a moment. Um, Mine doesn't give it to me broken out the same way Lavin's does, and that's that's okay. Um, so like here's my one. Is it, is it working? Yep. Okay. So like mine has it last name, comma, first name already, and that works out perfect because if you look, that's how they wanted it. But like let's pretend at the school I teach at, they log in using their email addresses, which is it's common for some of our schools and you don't want them to have to remember a different one, you could manipulate that then. And so um, then I could just automatically drop it in and it's going to create it then because I identified that third column. So if you do that, it's saying if you don't specify a, a username, it'll create them automatically like Lavin just described. If you do, it'll create them and choose the passwords to be the same as the usernames for the very first time they log in. So when I did it, I tried to, whatever our school uses, it might be helpful for, since they already know how they log in, um, to set it up to be that same way. Some of us, it'll be like their last name and then their, their user number at the school, and I was able to pull those from it. So it's sometimes just, just a little bit of playing around. But it can recognize a comma or a tab 
between those cells. So usually you're not having to do a whole lot of editing. You might have to like do a comma row right here if you need to split something out. Um, but I was able to pretty much pull the rosters from every single course I taught and dump them all in, dump in all 200 names and it makes those profiles really, really fast. So the goal is that you're not spending time giving them access codes and all of this stuff. You just have to download your rosters for each class, dump them in, make the accounts. The nice thing about doing it this way is you don't have duplicate accounts. Um, for example, if you had, it happened often for me with siblings. Um, so say I had Amber Smith and Amy Smith. Um, whoever was in a class first got A. Smith as their username. Um, and then the sibling would get A. Smith 1, um, but we wouldn't realize it until they realized their sibling didn't change their password and logged into their sibling's account, um, or they weren't able to get in. And then I would remember usually that they had a sibling with the same initial. Um, so the nice thing about how Zane showed us is that um, every student already has their own unique username. Um, so if you're able to download it in a way that has like a student ID or an email address, um, that is the benefit of doing it that way. What can we clarify about adding students to AET? One thing for the username, like you say siblings, I had one that graduated like a year or two ago. I went and changed his username to because they both started with the letter C. That way the new one coming in can just use, you know, this letter rather than trying to remember there's an A after the C before the last name or something. That's a good idea. I never remember until there was an issue. <laughs> I would say if there's a way to figure out how your, whatever your school uses for computer logins, if you still do that, if you're one-to-one, -one, maybe you don't. Um, that seems to be a really easy way. Yep. The other nice thing is once you're in this system, um, then when you pull up this list, you can just click on the student's name um, and reset their password. And I always reset their password to whatever their username is because you never want to know what a student's password is. Um, and so it's really easy to just click on their name, copy their username, put it in as their password and then tell them to go log in and change their password. And that's where you can change their username like John said. Any questions on that? All right, so the last thing is the first day of school. Um, so if you go under AET resources to this week's help sheet, day one with students, this is actually the student checklist, um, which is the first time you're seeing one of these. Um, AET has curriculum resources and this is <laughs> probably the sheet that I made the copy of the most um, because I gave one of these to every single student. The one thing that I modified before I print or before I copied it is I put in our chapter number here. Um, so I put in MN0129 for Hutchinson, and then I ran off hundreds of copies to get me through, you know, the 12 classes I taught in the year. Um, so this is a step-by-step -step sheet for our students on how to actually log in. Um, so they're able to put in the chapter number before, I always told them before I left the class, this is your username, and then this would be your password. Um, and then it walks them through the exact steps that they need to in order to complete their profile. So this would be a great uh, assignment for maybe that first week or two of school, especially in that distance learning mode, uh, where we can have the students, we just, dump in our rosters, the students create their profiles. Um, Paul and I were talking like, don't we have access to some of the state end Perkins? And that's correct. We have it for some, but we don't have it for seventh and eighth grade. And the, you know, the data we were reporting before in those surveys wasn't really reliable. And so by having students self report some of this information, like at the upper parts there, Lavin, uh, this bio here, it'll ask them there. It's a little smaller here, but this thing on the left where it shows their little profile, 
Um, that's all the info we're really looking for. Um, and this, this would tell us everything, the mailing address, the race, ethnicity, uh, shirt size, all that stuff then can be exported over to the FFA roster, exported over to event registrations. And so when you're registering, you know, Roger, this student right here for an FFA conference, we already know that they're a male student and they would wear a medium shirt size and all of that info. So it would save you a lot of time um, managing your program. Questions on this? Again, this is, it's all ag ed students. So ideally this would be a class activity. And then the students, when they complete this, they can opt in to FFA on their side, or you can pull them in on to FFA on your end when you submit. We'll show that in a future um, video here, but say you have an application that you want them to fill them out or they pay for membership. You might have some system like that where you can pull them in. Um, or if you're affiliated, it's really easy because you don't, you don't do anything. You just submit the whole thing. Yep. But they can do it on their end or on your end, but you would still approve them before anything gets turned in. And we'll talk more on that in the future. The last thing that makes it really easy as a teacher to grade this is if we go to reports and then student grading report. On one page, you can see if they've completed their contact info <laughs> and their FFA info, if it's relevant. Um, and then if you do graded um, SAE, leadership and service hours, things like that, you can see how many hours, dollars, journal entries, all of that stuff on one page. Um, once you set up your classes, um, you can also sort them by classes if you set them up that way. And so it can correspond with your grade book. Um, so I always had setting up their profile was worth like 10 points. Um, and then it was out of 100%. So if it was 20% complete, they got two points until it was 100% complete. Um, and so that was how I kept track of knowing if their contact information was completely filled out. Um, but to me, this was the easiest way to go in instead of clicking through 200 students' profiles. Um, again, you just go under reports, under reports, student grading report, and it pulls it all up. For those classes, do you have to add them or do they like click something and then that puts them in the class or how does that work exactly? Yeah, good question. So that's why it's important for us to do the teacher, the, the school profile first, where we enter our teachers, and then for each teacher to do their courses. Because if Lavinrata didn't put in intro to animal science, um, I, as a student, I wouldn't be able to select that then. Um, I can only select the courses that are available by the teachers. Yeah. Okay. So once they select it, then it'll be, it'll mm -hmm. populate. Yeah, and this is showing up weird because of the start and end date. So you're not seeing the classes that technically start in September. So right now, according to my class list, I only am teaching intro to animal science right now. So, and you can sort it by teacher too. And then the course within that teacher. But there's some helpful tools in here, like the sending a message to students who've never logged in, which you might want to try a different approach than if they've never logged in. But you could send a message to those who haven't done any entries yet or any SAE hours if you're grading SAE. Um, and even a quick view, like seeing that Lavin did four hours, but only one entry. So sometimes students will try to say, well, I did 20 hours in one event, and that one event was an FFA meeting. Um, it's a little easy then to kind of call that out. Um, so there, at a bird's eye view, there's some pretty helpful stuff here to figure out what's missing, what still needs to be worked on. So I, I guess if I know that I'm not in the classroom right now, but if I were teaching and needed some activities to kind of help feel comfortable with it, I might assign this as one activity and then have them do their resume and some of those other activities, um, just to kind of get me through my first week of instruction that might buy some extra time. 
the other thing um, I taught on trimesters and so so many hours or dollars were due for SAE um, by certain dates and so you can sort by due dates and so I could put like the beginning of the trimester to mid try um, for the first part of the semester's grade and then mid try to the end of the try to get the second semester grade um, or just that one trimester to make sure that they're getting credit for that trimester's work. Um, so I used the start date and end date a lot when I was grading to make sure that I was grading that 12 weeks of work and not the full years of work. So that's another helpful tool. How else can we help? So remember in, in the emails that we sent out or even the AET resources page on Minnesota FFA, there's lots of topics. Most of them are optional depending on what you'd like to use them for. Uh, what, the only changes happened so far is we're not using FFA.org and having you type all this stuff in because that can be a lot of work. So instead we're recommending as a way to save time that you create profiles using your rosters and uh, have students enter in their own information to save you some time. So you would set up your school profile and add all your teachers. You would set up your teacher profiles and that'll give us all the data that we need for Department of Ed. We can share that with MAAE, FFA, MALC. It kind of creates this one central database for us to all use. And then you have your students get put in and that will be used to generate their registration information, your, your FFA memberships, all of it. Everything else in the system, there's lots of other stuff they can do. Like a couple weeks ago, we showed POA and you know chapter officer planning. That's just an optional tool. We recommend it because it's good, but it's not required and, and won't be required at least for the time being until you as a teachers decide that's something you all want to do. And we'll continue to talk in future weeks about how to use this for SAE um, as an instructional tool, how that SAE instructional tool can generate award applications. But right now it's just the school profile and then the teacher profile. And then you enter your students in so they can do their student profiles. And from that, we can pull all of our data and we can generate your FFA roster. Looking forward, next week we're going to talk about training agreements and getting started with SAE. Um, I think that's a helpful tool to consider as we transition possibly between hybrid and face-to-face -face and online or distance education. Um, and then we're going to start meeting every other week as topics allow. Um, so we'll skip the first week of school for most of us um, and then we'll start going into SAE records um, journals, assessment, and some of those tools every other week. Um, so you'll be getting an email with invitations to the next couple of meetings for September and um, some other helpful tools to help us as we start the school year. What questions do you guys have? Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, um, I have a question about um, this is a little off topic for today's discussion, so if it needs to wait till later, that's fine. But a purchase order, or was I forget how that conversation was supposed to go? Yep, so you'll be getting a bill um, through the QuickBooks system, much like your FFA membership. Um, so those will be coming out in the next two weeks um, that'll have that. And um, your business manager should process that as a program expense, not as an FFA expense, um, so that they're able to levy that. Does that help? Okay, so I, I know they always ask me, can this be through Carl's Perkins? Is that a yes or no, or that can be? Yeah, there's it's a couple ways you could do, do this, right? Um, I, I think our best approach is to run it through our district and use... Um, levy dollars because those will get reimbursed. Um, okay. Some consortia have made the decision to use um, AET as a consortium wide base. Uh, at least one has talked about doing that. And so they might be giving funding, but really 
I encourage us to think about Carl Perkins funding as like male C funding. It's really for those innovative, cutting edge things. It's probably not funding the same thing year over year. Um, so just know Perkins funding wouldn't get reimbursed that same way, but you will, you could do, so we're gonna pay for two thirds of AET. You're probably gonna have like a $60 expense or something that would be left for that other third. Um, so you could use Perkins one time for this and then try to figure it out. But if, if you find yourself in a bind where you can't, they're not gonna let you, uh, they're not gonna give you more money for levy. You can't use Perkins funding. Let us know and we'll try to help out. We don't want you having to pay this from your program. Okay. Which I, I think this year is going to be the majority. I, I don't see schools saying we'll just take those lovey dollars and give them to you. Yeah, and Paul's kind of right. It's hard to talk about levy because levy is a reimbursement. What I, if I were teaching, what I would go down and, and say is we're going to get this grant from Mail C and you'll get it levied back, but I probably need an increase in my budget. And that's silly when it's like 60 bucks, but if my budget is $5,000, can it be $5,060 knowing that you're gonna get that $60 back? And it, it'll it get easier, I think, as you work forward in the future with it. And it might not, Paul's right, it might not happen this year, but um, th I think that's our goal because they're gonna get the reimbursement back. They just probably need a plan for it. Um, Cause you still want them to pay it out of the ag program. They're not going to pay it out of some other account. What we don't want to do is pay it out of FFA because this isn't an FFA account and FFA is not a leviable item. Sure. Okay. I, that Zane, that is probably a good way of handling it. And probably to our teachers saying that, you know, sit down with your administration and see if going ahead, like, you know, this year it's going to be tough. Budgets are going to be tight anyway. Um, but going ahead, knowing that this money is coming back. I like that idea. And so maybe, I mean, 60 bucks isn't a lot, right? Like I probably spent more than that on pizza for an FFA meeting. Um, so maybe if you're, if you're putting it out of your ag budget, this year's not a big issue, but going forward, we want to try to capture as much in our levy as our school is comfortable. And so um, if I were still teaching, I would start running all my FFA activities through the program because FFA is curricular and even food for a meeting is still a leadership supply. Um, because the more we put in there, the more that can come back and levy if they're capturing supply. So uh, it's just about working with our schools. We know this is going to take time. But if you find yourself in a bind and this is a, a problem, you don't have the money, your school is not being helpful or doesn't know what to do, let us know because we can try to support you. And then if there is no option. We've got some money set aside to help schools in, in that situation. What we don't want is for this to become a fiscal like, burden for you. But when we get the bill, we pay the whole thing to Minnesota, correct? And then um, we get reimbursed the MAELC part, which is the 65%, and then the last 35% of that whole check that got sent out is for the levy then, right? Yep, you'll get a bill for 100% and then get, that you'll pay to Minnesota FFA and then FFA with our mail C grant will pay you back 65%. Okay. That's correct. And if your school asks like, FFA is just a fiscal agent, this isn't an FFA program, it's just a, it's a lot easier for FFA to send out checks than it is for the Department of Ed or Mail C to send out 180 checks. And I got the list of business managers that deal with the levy, so I'm going to be sending an email out here to them as well. It took a little bit to get that information, but they'll get a notice from me to kind of explaining this. Um, a lot of business managers don't, don't even know that they can put supplies in. Does it look fishy though, sending a check to Minnesota FFA and say it's a program thing, not an FFA thing? Mm, yeah, I mean, maybe that's a decent point. FFA is part of our program and um, our letter does say that FFA is just the fiscal agent, but that's why that letter has multiple names on it for Team Ag Ed. Um, but what we, I, the point is that it isn't just for FFA members. I think that's the piece we're trying to clarify. 
this is more than just an FFA program. You'll use this for FFA membership this year, but it also provides instructional tools for work-based learning in FFA. Um, it provides tools that you can use for teaching. So it, this can be an FFA tool, but it can also be more than that. So we don't want us to just think of this as just an FFA tool. Okay. Other questions? All right, well, if you think of anything, let Zainer, I know, um, as I said, next week, we're going to be looking at training agreements and getting started on SAEs um, for all of our students. But um, again, remember to do your profiles, make sure your classes are in there, and that's going to make our lives a lot easier grading um, these profiles to make sure our students have them complete. If you have any other questions, let us know. Um, otherwise, we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. See you later. Okay.